So our speaker to today, I am uh, very pleased to have Mir Mirna Jamonia, and she has a new affiliation, I think. Mirna uh, is now in Paris at the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology. I had to look that up and remember it, Mirna. That is a long name and sounds like a great place to be. So Mirna is going to speak today on logics that uh, make a bridge from the discrete to the continuous. Go ahead, Mirna. Thank you very much, Rika. Well, uh, yes, I have moved recently. This is really quite recent because my contract at UEA uh, officially finished on the 31st of August. I spent 22 years at UEA and was very happy there. And now I'm doing new things. And uh, well, I'm remaining as a visiting professor at uh, UEA, so I still have connections there. Uh, in particular, my students are well taken care of, which is very important when you move places at this kind of uh, time in your career. So I uh, work at the University Pantheon Sorbonne, so I put a picture of the Pantheon. Uh, and I hope that uh, once the difficulties that we have been suffering with COVID are over, we can all meet here or in New York or some other places. Uh, so I said here, it is Vika Virtual Century Seminar, and I ask everybody else who is involved in organizing this seminar to forgive me this uh, putting forward only one person, but I uh, think that Vika has somehow been uh, very important in keeping this seminar online throughout the summer, which uh, I think is uh, quite amazing. And uh, so I wanted to, to somehow note that at the beginning of my talk. So I'm going to talk about uh, things that I have, uh, that are in progress. There will be some uh, results that I have obtained and there will be some results that I am working on and some that I am uh, hoping to obtain. But uh, this will really somehow also be a, 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 an opportunity to, uh, to cover something that I think has been, has gone a little bit unnoticed in the world of logic and set theory. So that's what I would like to speak about. And uh, well, yes, it's nice here. We are starting our evening. I've spent a wonderful afternoon and I hope that this talk will make you spend a nice afternoon where you are. On logics that make a bridge from the discrete to the continuous. So let's start. This is how our, our program is, will be looking. We'll talk a little bit about the concept of combinatorial limits. And then we'll draw some connections to model theory. And finally, in the third part, we will talk about introducing new logics and comparing them with the aim of capturing by these new logics the connections that exist between model theory, set theory, and this new concept of combinatorial limits. So let's see what I mean by the new concept of combinatorial limits. That will be our introduction. Here is a picture. On this picture, on the one side, you see a sequence of graphs. Think of them as finite graphs increasing in size. And on the other side, you see a function that is a continuous function or a measurable function from the square of the unit interval into zero one. So on the one side of this picture, you have a discrete a sequence of discrete objects. And on the other side, you have this measurable function and combinatorial limits are a way to connect the two. You might have heard of combinatorial limits uh, by the name of graphon. Graphons were the first kind of combinatorial limit that we are developed. And they uh, address exactly the uh, situation that I have shown here. They address a se countable sequence of finite graphs that somehow magically has a limit, which is this uncountable object which is a measurable function. 
And uh, this was discovered by Lovash and his group, so many people. Uh, uh, he was the, the leader of that group. And this was discovered around 2006. And I would say that uh, this has been really one of the main discoveries in discrete mathematics. The reason is that there are many applications of this, not only that it gives a very beautiful and unexpected theory that connects the discrete and the continuous, but also it has many applications. And in fact, uh, Lovash explains that the program was motivated not only by mathematics, notably extreme combinatorics, extreme combinatorics, but also questions that people have asked him about statistics and also about applied networks. And uh, one thing that perhaps some of you have already uh, engaged with is the notion of expander graphs, which was around before the graph forms. So the expander graphs was exactly a concept uh, that studied increasing sequences of graphs with the idea of modeling some sort of a network that changes dynamically. So it, you can think, for example, of a telephone network that increases in time. So um, a graph phone is there for an uncountable limit of a sequence of finite graphs. And when I first read this, I thought it was very curious to have an uncountable object which represents a sequence of a finite graph. Studying it further, I have realized that I have already seen that concept and I will tell you that a little bit later in this talk. So a graph one, in fact, is a measurable function that goes from zero one or the times zero one to zero one, and it represents this sequence. Uh, what does it mean it represents the sequence? Well, in the sense that certain graph invariants of this sequence are transferred between the sequence to this graph form. So just to make this a little bit more mysterious, let me uh, tell you that, for example, a graph could be considered as some sort of a very simple measurable function. If you think of a finite graph, let us say, um, I don't know, adjacency matrix of some, you can think of its adjacency matrix, uh, and then it is uh, in the adjacency matrix, you have values zero and one. So if you have an n by n matrix, you could represent this as a step function. You divide the one copy of zero one into n intervals and the other copy into n intervals. And then uh, you color, for example, a square that corresponds to ij in this division, where i is less than n and j is less than n. You color it red if the adjacency matrix has value zero and blue if it has value one. And so you get some, this is actually a step function, a very simple function, measurable function. So uh, in, in a sense, graph one is obtained by iterating this process. Uh, let me talk a little bit about these graph invariants. Uh, the main graph invariant that uh, occurs in the treatment of graph forms, at least for, for, to introduce them, is the, the notion of graph homomorphism density. Uh, so what is the homomorphism density? You need two graphs to define the homomorphism density. Think of a small graph F and a large graph G. And what you like to measure, they are both finite, and you would like to measure the number of homomorphic copies of F in G. That's called the homomorphic density. And uh, homomorphisms are embeddings that are allowed to squish some points. So these are what graph theory is called weak embeddings. And in fact, one can define something like this graph homomorphism for measurable functions and then have this sort of equations. So you take a fixed graph F and you look at homomorphism density of this graph in the sequence G. So uh, the sequence of these G Ns, for every N you calculate the value of the homomorphic density F in G N, and then you take a limit. And in certain circumstances, such a limit exists. 
and in fact is equal to this integral. The integral is calculated over this graphon that represents the sequence. The graphon is called gamma, and the formula looks a little bit scary, but simply what it says, you take as many uh, vertices that are in F, uh, for example, if F is just an edge, you can just take two vertices, and then you take two variables, which will be then x0 and x1, for example, so you will have some double integral, and then you will look at the value of the function gamma, uh, at these two well, uh, if we are in the simple case of an edge, we will take i equal to zero, j equal to one, so we will have just one value g of x, gamma of x zero, x one. So that's what is meant by tra uh, transferring the values. Of course, this doesn't work for any sequence of GNs because uh, if you just take any sequence of graph GN, there is no reason that this limit would actually exist. But there is a metric notion on graphs, which is called cut metric, uh, such that if a sequence of graphs converges in that cut metric, then there is this limiting object called the graphon, which has this property. So the cut metric, uh, those of you who have studied uh, graph theory probably know what this is. It's not easy to define and it is not important for us to, to know what it is, so I'm not going to define it, but just it's important to take this idea that there is a notion of convergence that captures this. Let me also point out something else. This formula that I've written is trivial if you are dealing with a sequence GNs which has less and less edges. Because if you, uh, these are called sparse graphs, if you take a, such sparse graphs such that the number of edges goes to uh, zero as n goes to infinity, then uh, of course even for, for, for f being a simple edge, this limit would be equal to zero. So we would just get zeros everywhere and the graph one would be the zero graph the zero function, so it wouldn't give us very much of a context. So this notion of graphons is only interesting uh, for those graphs, <coughs> excuse me, for those graph sequences that are dense. That means that uh, there is something, some non-zero value in this limit. So if you are curious about this notion, you can uh, read this very nice book uh, by Lovas which is called Large Networks and Graph Limits. And uh, it ex it's, a, it's a big book that explains this concept, uh, both mathematically and also in its applications. Now, uh, many other notions of combinatorial limits have been introduced since. Since you are in this uh, New York seminar, perhaps you might remember a work that uh, James Cummings did with uh, one of his students a few years ago in which he uh, connected the notion of graph graphons with Jasper of flag algebras in a, in a paper that I think unfortunately still hasn't been published for whatever reason, but has been around as an archive preprint. So maybe you spoke about that in your seminar. Uh, let me mention that this, uh, notion of graphon somehow has been a revenge of graph theory and discrete mathematics to those who have been looking down at it perhaps uh, in certain societies, mathematical societies, there have been this idea of graph theory being a game with no theory in which clever people sit down and ask questions that are just coming out of their head and have nothing to do with real mathematics. And uh, this image of discrete mathematics in general, I think has been applied to many contexts, including set theory. And uh, so I am doubly pleased to see that this idea of graphons has gained such a recognition everywhere. And somehow I see it as a revenge of the discrete mathematics uh, and uh, the, it deserves, it gets the recognition that it deserves. And, uh, if you are familiar with uh, this, the grant system here in Europe, 
Well, there are some really huge grants that are given by the European Research Council. And among them, there are the hugest ones. They are called Synergy Grants. And so far, they have given two of them in mathematics. They are open to all subjects. And the first one was given to this subject, to this group here, which is uh, Lovas, Jaroslav Neshetril in Prague, and Laszlo, uh, Albert Laszlo Barabash, Barabashi, who is uh, working in theory of networks. And you can see uh, the huge amount of investments that was made. It's uh, almost nine and a half million euros. Uh, so uh, the subject has really gained a lot of recognition. Uh, now let us talk a little bit about various generalizations of graphons. I have mentioned one that was uh, done by James Cummings. Uh, let me mention this idea of modeling, which I find particularly exciting, interesting. Let me remind you of what we have just said about sparse graphs and dense graphs. I put again this formula to uh, convince you that this formula is not very interesting if the limit on the left-hand side is equal to zero. So if you want to deal with sequences of sparse graphs, then you need to invent a new notion. And this was done by uh, Benjamini and Schramm uh, through a notion called graphing. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, notion Others like Neshetri or Sona de Mendes have worked on this. Uh, but the, the problem of this graphing was that it somehow didn't have anything to do with graph fonts. That is, it was somehow orthogonal to the graph fonts. And then a very nice unifying theory came out through the work of Neshetri and Sona de Mendes. And this is when we now are going to start seeing something to do with logic. So they were able, and said theory, they were able to introduce a combinatorial limit, which is actually a Borel space. Uh, so they talk uh, about, they, they call this first order convergence. I'm going to define it for you. And the first order convergence leads to the limit notion, which is called modeling. And this mod notion of modeling has a nice property that if you apply it to a sequence of dense graphs, then you get back a graph form. And you, if you apply it to a sequence of sparse graphs, then you get the graphing. So it's a unifying notion. And let me show you this uh, definition that comes from this book, uh, a unified approach to structural limits and limits of graphs with bounded Three depth. Uh, so this modeling is actually going to be the first of the connections to model theory and set theory that I want to present. So what is the first order convergence? Uh, well, let us put ourselves in the frame a little bit more general than graphs. Let us think of some, some finite relational language. And let us think of a sequence of finite structures on this language, which we are going to call AS. So this could be graphs, but they could be something else. And now we're going to define what is meant by a finite first order convergence, which is defined like this. We define first of all for every formula, let us say a formula phi with k many free variables and the structure a n, one of those structures that we have there, we are going to define what we mean by a stone pairing between the formula phi and the structure a n. And basically, it is simply the probability that a random k element subset of a n satisfies phi. So if you think of that graph density, it would be a special case of this. There we have measured the probability that a random element having the same size as the graph f is actually a copy of the size n. 
of the graph f. And this can be said using a first order formula. So you can see that this stone pairing is actually uh, a generalization of the graph homomorphism de density. So to be precise, to, to put some mathematical symbols here, the stone pairing between phi and a n is defined as the cardinality of all k sequences in a n such that a n satisfies phi when the free variables of phi are applied, replaced by this by the elements of the sequence. And then this is divided by the size of the family of all k element subsets of a n. So that's the pairing. And then here comes the notion of convergence. The convergence says that the sequence of structures is first order convergent if the limit exists for all phi. So this seems quite difficult to check if the limit exists for all phi, or perhaps it's easy to invalidate if there is no limit, but uh, it seems a little bit abstract. So it is somewhat uh, surprising when you read in this theory to see that in many situations there actually there is this limit. And moreover, that this limit gives rise to a uncountable Borel space, a standard Borel space, so uncountable, which is a combinatorial limit of, in this concept of first order convergence. So this is a Borel space, which we also interpret as a tau structure, so we interpret the language tau. And then we have that the stone pairing F of A is the limit of this sequence. Of course, this stone pairing of phi and A has to be defined because what I have defined above works only for finite structures and this A is now a Borel space. But well, I will not go to the idea of how this is defined. You can look at the book that I gave you if you're interested. But uh, this is how you obtained modeling. And I personally feel that it is interesting for set theorists and model theorists to look at these notions and uh, study, for example, the complexity of various relations that can be defined and so forth. So that's one example of the connection between the combinatorial limits and the kind of things that we do in set theory and model theory. Let me now go to the next slide. When I told you that at the beginning, when I first realized that the sequence, countable sequence of finite structures was represented by an uncountable object that was surprising to me. And then I thought a little bit more and I realized that I've seen that already and we have all seen it in the concept of ultra products. If you take an ultra product of a sequence of finite graphs, then this is going to be obviously a, uh, an uh, uncountable object, which is somehow to re going to represent them. And uh, in, in fact, it turns out that there is some connection, quite a close connection between ultra products and graphons. And uh, this is not how graphons were developed, but when people tried to define hypergraphons, then they discovered this connection. So this was done uh, by Alec and Segedi in 2010. So what they wanted to do is to generalize the concept of a graphon to the situation when each GN is not a graph, but a hypergraph. So what they did is to consider an ultra product, but with one additional ingredient. So we have seen that in the idea of a graph one, there is a measure, there is the Lebesgue measure that we obtain and we consider Lebesgue measurable functions. So in this ultra product also, we should come up with some sort of a measure that would represent our situation. So how do we get the measure on the ultra product? So if we consider, for example, hypergraphs or any finite object, we can uh, look at the counting measure on it. So we can 
now consider the, the ultra product of these hypergraphs as they were doing with these counting measures. Uh, and then those of you who uh, remember what is in the good old Chen Kiesler book in model theory, which is for me still a standard reference, in model theory, you will remember the idea of load measure. Actually, these kind of measures were studied extensively in model theory, especially in non-start analysis. And uh, certainly this concept of taking an ultra product of, pro of objects that have a measure on them is known. And the measure could be something much more complicated than the counting measures. Now the, the graph forms are defined on a separable measure, that is the Lebesgue measure. So uh, a, an important part of the work of Alec and Segedi was to find a certain separable quotient of the lobe measure, which will represent the hypergraph form. In later work by Zhu, it was shown that actually the hypergraph form can be represented also as a graph form but uh, not a graph one of the kind that I have introduced to you, but the graph one over some more complex measure space. But for us, what is there to remember is that actually we see now in, in, in this special case of something that we know well, this is a special case of the classical love measure on ultra products, which comes from 1975 and a countably generated substructure. Uh, so the work of James Cummings that I mentioned to you uh, in the background had this as well, although he expressed, uh, so, so the name of his students was Ashkavar. So uh, maybe you know the student better than I do. Anyway, so they managed to make a connection between this and the diaspora of flag algebra. So any graph one can be obtained in this way as well. So as often happens in the in model theory of this kind, said theoretic model theory, and in said theory, we might feel that we have somewhat missed the train by looking uh, at the greatest generality, we perhaps did not realize that our constructions when taken in the simplest possible case, which are finite, will have to give something very interesting. Uh, so let me mention also the work of our colleagues in descriptive uh, set theory, uh, people that we all know, Conley, Kekris, and Takar so what they did is to consider how one could do uh, measure preserving actions, how one could take a energetic point of view on all of this. And um, there is this paper that they have done in 2012, ultra products of measure preserving actions and graph combinatorics, which perhaps will interest you if you look it up. Uh, so now, as I said, we have uh, the simplest case of our favorite construction, which is the ultra product, or I, I should have said here ultra products rather than ultra powers, uh, is when we have finite structures. So like, like in the case of graph forms. Now, uh, finite ultra, ultra powers or ultra products of finite objects are actually quite interesting. And uh, if you look at some recent papers of Shella, you will see that calculating the sizes of various things that can appear in an ultra product of finite objects is quite a complicated matter. But I think it is safe to say that they haven't been studied so much in set theory, but they have been studied in model theory, quite extensively actually. So there's the model theory of pseudo finite objects. I ask you for one second just to turn on the light because I think that I, my face is fading and I like to keep this eye contact with you. It's getting dark here. So Günther, if you can just stop the recording for one second. You can restart if you like. Okay, you're good to go. Mm -hmm.
Thank you. <laughs> so I was saying uh, that in model theory, people have been looking at the concept of pseudo finite objects, which are nothing more than the ultra products of finite objects. In fact, in group theory, people have been looking at this for ages in the concept of profinite groups. Uh, but in model theory, uh, I can mention the work of Prushovsky, for example, and some others, which has been used to obtain very deep combinatorial results. If you have been following things that Archem Chernikov has been doing, uh, they have to do with applications of this idea of pseudo-finite objects to uh, classical Erdos-style combinatorics. So what I will do is to uh, show you one application of this pseudo-finite objects and then show you how in my work with Ivan Tomasic we connected that with the uh, notion of graphons. So to give some context to what I want to show you is uh, perhaps you know the Semered irregularity lemma, it is quite celebrated. And it basically says that when you have a large enough graph, you can cut the graph to a number of pieces of same size with some extra vertices, small number of extra vertices. And within each of these pieces, the graph is going to be regular, going to be regular basically in this cut matrix. And this lemma is more or less equivalent to the fact that when you look at the space of graphons, so this is a space of measurable functions, symmetric measurable functions from the square of the unit interval to itself. In this space, you can also define a metric which is inherited from this idea of graphs. And it turns out that the space of graphons is compact in that metric and to prove that you use this regularity lens. Now, uh, Tao proved an algebraic regularity lemma, which I'm going to show to you now. Uh, he proved this in 2012 using uh, methods of spectral analysis. So here is his al lemma, algebraic regularity lemma. It applies to uh, the situation where we have certain definable subsets of a finite field. So this field is going to be called F. And think of some notion of complexity. It's not quite important what that notion might be. So imagine you have some notion of complexity which measures complexity of definable subsets of your field. And we will be looking at a situation when we have two definable subsets of the field. And we also have a definable subset of the product of these two. So you can think of V and W as vertices of some graph and E as the edges. And we will re require that they are all definable uh, and that they all have bounded complexity. Now Tao says that in the case that F has a sufficiently large characteristic, which depends on this value of M, then we can partition the vertices in V and the vertices in W into pieces, which look like the pieces that appear in the Semred irregularity lemma. Uh, that is, they all have uh, some size. Uh, similar size, there is some regularity behavior of the edges. Well, it's some formula, this formula too, which uh, basically tells you that modulo a small mistake, the number of edges in uh, every subset A times B, uh, such that A is a subset of VI and B is a subset of WJ, is basically a constant times the size of these subsets. So there is a constant which works for all subsets. This is very similar to the regularity in the semi-regularity lemma. And finally, all of these pieces are definable. 
So that's why this is called regularity lemma because it really is a statement that corresponds to the Semmerad irregularity lemma. And what happened with this uh, regularity lemma is that it got a new proof by model theorists using the pseudo-finite structures. Tarchenko and Pile were able to remove this characteristic of F being sufficiently large requirement. So what I've underlined here in red is not really necessary in this, thanks to, uh, and this is known, thanks to the work of Starchenko and Pile. Uh, now in our field and set theory, I think for many years we have suffered from the fact that uh, many results were known and not published and just given to the friends. Uh, it turns out that in model theory, it seems to be worse. <laughs> so this paper never was published, although many people know about it. And also uh, there was an independent development by Hrushovsky, which not only wasn't published, but uh, it wasn't even publicized. In fact, Hrushovsky just wrote the letter to Tao to tell him that he drew this theorem. But anyway, through all of these developments, it is known that Tao's regularity lemma does not require the field to have a large characteristic. And if you want to learn about this, there was a special semester on model theory in Berkeley a few years ago where Tao gave a, a talk about this. It's a very nice talk to watch. Now, let me tell you what Ivan Tomasic and I did in a, in a paper that we produced in 2017. We gave an alternative proof using graphons in which we were able to improve somewhat the bounds that appeared in the sarchenko file paper. And in fact, what we proved is the following general theorem uh, regarding graphons that take values zero and one almost everywhere. So what we proved that when we look at in the space of graphons, Now imagine that you have some uh, class of structures. Let us first think of those finite fields, but in fact, the theorem is more general. So let's think of the finite fields in place of the, what I wrote in red, which is asymptotic class. And we now look at all possible definable bipartite graphs over these structures. This is exactly what appears in the Tau's lemma. So now we have some set of graphons. And what we have shown is that we look at the set of accumulation points in this space given with the cut method, we actually get just a finite set of step functions. So we get a very simple situation. And in fact, this applies to a more general class, not just the finite field, this applies to asymptotic classes, which I will define in a few minutes. And uh, not surprisingly, Khrushchevsky has also seen this result, but we were not aware of it, nor was anybody else but him and Tao, because a, uh, he proved it in his own way uh, when he wrote to Tao. Uh, so what is an asymptotic class? Let me give you first an intuition and then a definition. It is a certain hereditary class of finite structures. And uh, this is a, the official definition of what an asymptotic class is. You have some class of finite structures and you, if you wish, may consider it as a category with substructure embedding. Uh, and then we give a definition that comes from the work of McPherson and Steinhorn. Uh, and we say that C is an asymptotic class. If for every definable set X over this uh, set of structures S, there exists a definable function, which is kind of a rationally valued measure, mu X, 
And another definable function, which is sort of a dimension, dx, such that the equation that you see on the bottom of this definition holds. So what does that equation actually say? It looks, it, it says that when you look at the realization of x over f, then it's sort of measured by this measure mu modulo a mistake that you can calculate using this dimension d. So this is like uh, the uh, approximations in the tau regularity lemma, it's similar type of approximations. Anyway, uh, the details are not so important for us. Uh, what is important is that this work connects now these notions to something that we like very much in set theory and people like in model theory, which is this notion of hereditary classes of finite structures. So you can just think of what we proved is that the graph forms generated by graphs coming from a certain hereditary class are simple. That's really what this is all about. And let me say that uh, even then I are thinking of gen generalizing this uh, because we find ourselves with graph forms, which are, as we mentioned, uh, applicable to uh, dense graphs. And we are thinking of how we could generalize this using the idea of modeling to get a version of Tau's lemma, which would have uh, another measure of density would apply to, uh, if you look at Tau's lemma, oops, there it is. It also requires, it only makes sense if this E is kind of large. And so we would like to have a localized version using modeling. So this is our work in progress. Uh, but I'll pass on that uh, to move to the connection of all of this with this notion of ages, which is, uh, as you know, an age of a countable structure is uh, the set of all its finite substructures considered modulo isomorphism. And uh, we have seen that uh, somehow graphons can be connected with certain families of finite structures in which we have looked at some hereditary classes and we have been able to say that if the hereditary class is simple in some sense, then the graph forms that this hereditary class generate are also simple. Uh, well, so if you start talking about model theory, then uh, these notions start having a concrete meaning because in model theory, there is classification which classifies theories. In particular, it classifies countable objects. So you may ask now, is there some connection between that classification and uh, the kind of simplicity of the graph form space? So th this is a concrete question. Suppose you have a hereditary class of graphs and you would like to know the conditions from that class that guarantee that the graph forms generated by graphs in C are somehow simple. For example, have values zero and one. So uh, one of the first things that we obtained when we started looking at this question is that if you have a stable structure, then you get values zero and one. And then uh, by looking a little bit more into this book by Lovash, we noticed that he proved that exact same theorem, except he never used the word stable. So the graph theories do not necessarily operate with the notions that come from model theory and they uh, often prove theorems that we would formulate differently from the background of a logician, but the, the theorem is there. In fact, a much stronger theorem is true. Uh, so this is uh, what I mentioned already that the age of a countable structure is an example of a hereditary hereditary class, and you may think also of structures that you obtain through a Fresnel construction. If you take the age, that gives you a hereditary class, something like that. 
So as I said, uh, if we know a model theoretical classification of G, what can we say about graph forms that we generate by the age of this G? That is the general question. And here is a very beautiful theorem proved by Lovash and Seged in 2010, which when we translate into the language that we know better, would imply things like the following. Suppose that you have a graph that is NIP, not independence property. So this is more complicated than stable, but uh, it is NIP, doesn't have dependence property. Then uh, they prove that every graph on obtained from the age of this graph is zero one valued almost everywhere. So it is true that the model theoretical classification of the countable graph has something to do with the uh, with the simplicity of the graph on space obtained. So if you would like to, to read this, you are not going to find anything about NIP in their paper. What you will find rather is this Vapnik Chervonenkis dimension that uh, people study in combinatorics and which is actually has been proven to characterize NIP structures. So you need some translation using theorems from model theory, but at the end you obtain this. And as I said before, in particular, stable graphs are NIP. So now let me go to the third part of my talk, which is countable versus uncountable limit. So somehow from the beginning, it seems that there is something missing in the very first picture that I showed you. We have a sequence of, of finite graphs and we jump to this uncountable limit, there seems a place to discuss a countable structure that would be generated somehow by these graphs. And you get this idea when you study these hereditary classes as I have just uh, been doing with you. Uh, you can see that there is a countable structure flying around. So this part of my work is motivated by that observation. So, the discussion that we had about the connection between the properties of a hereditary class versus the shape of the graph form space that it generates illustrates that there is a connection between the countable limits and the uncountable limits. Uh, so let me just remind you that uh, what kind of countable limits we know how to take. Well, we know how to take a simple union or if a class is sufficiently uh, well behaved, then we also know how to take a Fraser limit. And we have seen a few uh, uncountable limits, some of them that we have known from before and some that perhaps uh, we learned in this talk. So ultra products, graph forms and modelings. The connection exists, but it's not so simple as we have seen. So our idea now would be to try to change the countable limit to better reflect the properties of the uncountable. Limit. So this is what I'm working on right now. So I would like to do this by changing the logic that I apply to study this countable object. So what does that mean to change the logic? What is the logic? So a logic in most people's minds would be something that we define through a syntactical recursive definition in which we say how we generate formulas. So for example, the first order logic is defined in that way. We say how we generate formulas from some language. And then we go one step further and connect this to a semantical notion of how we interpret these formulas. Again, defined recursively, for example, in the definition of tarski vot definition from first order model theory. Um, let me try to move to more light there. Yes, that looks better. So that's somehow the logic has a semantics and syntactics. And if you are very lucky, like in the case of first order theories, then the two are connected. Uh, however, there is something which is called a abstract model theory, which was really started uh, by Tarski and Vought in the 50s, there is much more variety as to what might be considered a logic. Uh, 
all of us know about tell omega one omega and l kappa kappa that comes from this time but there are many more notions that people studied in that time uh, one of them uh, has been appearing in my work recently uh, is the notion of chain logic that was introduced by Carol Karp in 1959. In fact, it has nothing to do, this particular logic has nothing to do with, uh, with the countable models because it was invented to study the logic L kappa kappa when kappa is a singular cardinal and mostly the singular cardinal of countable cofinality. But there is something from her idea that I've been able to apply in this case. Uh, so let me first say how this chain logic appeared in my work and what else from the trick will turn out to be relevant to what I'm going to say. So uh, in abstract logics, people have uh, like a holy grail to find logics that resemble as much as possible to the first order logic, but have more expressive power. Uh, so, uh, well, you perhaps know that the first logic is characterized by being the strongest possible logic that is compact and satisfies uh, downward 12-0 uh, Lovenheim's column theorem. This is the theorem of Lindstrom. So if we want to keep these two properties, there is nothing much more that we can say. Uh, but if we give up on some of it and replace the compactness, for example, by some uh, properties that look like compactness, for example, the impossibility of defining well order, one can obtain nice logics, uh, such as L omega one omega, which has an undefinability of well order. Uh, in recent years, there has been uh, interest in developing logics that uh, are able to express combinatorics at singular cardinals. And one such logic is Schellach's logic, L1 kappa, which is uh, an amazing work of genius, as much of his work is, in which he starts defining a logic not by any sort of syntax, but in immediately by semantics. So he defines what models are using some error freud trizet game, and then he defines what the sentence is. So it's a, it's a very interesting and beautiful logic that is perhaps uh, somewhat forbidding because of this, uh, because of the, I wouldn't say the lack of semantics, but in a com uh, of, of syntactics, but the complicated way in which syntactics is defined. And what he proved about this logic is a, a maximality theorem that resembles Lindstrom's theorem. And so with Van Annen, we realized that this logic that Schellach defined has many properties that connected with the chain logic from 1959, which is simple to define. And uh, so then we wanted to compare them and we actually realized that the chain logic has all the properties that uh, Schellach's logic does. But the difficulty of comparing them came from the fact that the notion of a model is different from one to the other. Uh, okay, I also mentioned some way of comparing logics, which I will say in a few minutes. And these notions were uh, to apply two transforms to comparing logics. And you can see a philosophical paper by Garcia Matos and Van Annen in which this appears first. But I will give you all the definitions. So in this field of abstract logics, what we're going to do is to forget semantics and syntax and simply look at triples. And these triples are going to have a form of some set of sentences, which we're going to call L, and some set of structures, which are, we are going to call S, and then some notion of satisfaction. So this notion of satisfaction, you can think of it as a subset of S times L, which says which structure satisfies which sentence. 
And uh, usually this comes with some notion of isomorphism, which you can understand uh, from the context. And this can really become very abstract and you can study even proper classes. Uh, many of these logics are not interesting because they do not satisfy what you would want really a basic thing from the logic. For example, to be closed at the negation. So uh, Shella uh, introduced this idea of nice logics. And what are they? They are closed under negation, conjunction, and disjunction. Uh, then some basic things can be said in the sentences that we are allowed to make. For example, if we have a relation symbol and constant symbols, then we can make a sentence saying that the relation holds on these constants. And then we have that the satisfaction relation uh, behaves with the respect of the negation as you would uh, expect. So if you have that n does not satisfy phi, then it satisfies the negation of phi. And then similarly for conjunction and disjunction. And then some more properties, which perhaps it's not so important that we look at them now, but just some properties that make this triple look really like a logic that you would expect. So that's called a nice logic. So what I've been interested to do is to use these ideas to introduce new logic on countable models, which would then be used to relate them to uncountable models, which we obtain as combinatorial limits. And this is really a work in progress, as I said, so uh, I'm not going to show you any huge theorems, but some interesting ideas, perhaps. Here is the first idea. How do we express the idea of an ultra filter using a countable model? This is going to be a simple example. Let me take a non principal ultra filter on omega and let me take a finite relational language tau. Now I'm going to take all possible first order sentences in this language to be my set of sentences L. And what I'm going to take for my structures are going to be infinite countable structures of this tau. And each one is going to come with a decomposition. So this is the idea that comes from chain logic, studying a structure together with the decomposition of that structure. So each structure is going to come with a decomposition and we are actually going to use this decomposition to define the notion of satisfaction in this logic. So when we have a, a sentence phi in first order sentence phi, and we have a structure M that came with the decomposition, we're going to say that M ultra filter satisfies phi if and only if the set of all indices where the finite structure uh, MN uh, satisfies phi is in the ultra filter. But here we have the real satisfaction, so in MN, we have the real satisfaction and in the countable model, we pick up in the notion of satisfaction, actually the definition of an ultra power. Then we can check that a triple defined like this forms a nice logic according to the definitions. And then a simple consequences of the a theorem that we all know, which is Walsh's transfer theorem for first order logic is the following observation that uh, the structure M is going to ultra filter satisfy a sentence phi if and only if the product, the ultra product of MN satisfies that sentence. So uh, at the price of changing the notion of satisfaction, we have now gotten rid of the idea of an ultra product. And why is this good? Uh, well, because it seems that we can play with this notion of satisfaction more than we can play with the notion of an ultra product. So let's try with some other objects. So we interpret the ultra filter through a countable model. Let us try it with this idea of modeling. So modeling is some standard Borel space which represents a, a sequence of finite relational structures. 
So we're going to take a finite relational language. And as in the previous example, we're going to take for our L the set of all first order sentences over this language. Then uh, we are still going to take the same kind of structures. There will be countable infinite structures that come with an increasing decomposition. I didn't write it into finite pieces, but I meant into finite pieces of increasing size. Can I ask you? Uh, yes. What, what do you mean by increasing decomposition? Just a union or? Union, yes. Because these are relational structures. Okay, so now we are going to define the modeling satisfaction relation. Well, the definition, uh, I'm sure you have already guessed that we're going to say that M is going to satisfy in the modeling way, a uh, sentence phi, if and only if the limit that then goes to infinity of the stone pairing at phi and Mn is equal to one. So in this way, we can prove a lemma almost as easily as the lemma that we have proved before. With the ultra powers, now we can say if there is a modeling of which we can call A of this sequence, then uh, actually the countable model M satisfies phi in the modeling way, if and only if the modeling A satisfies phi. And we can also see that in this case, the modeling logic is a nice logic. So now we have a countable mirror of this uncountable modeling. Uh, now to test this methodology, we could try to recover the headed, the, the, somehow the, the heuristics that we have from the work of Nesha, Trill, and Osona de Mendes, which told us that the graphon is a kind of special kind of modeling. How can we prove that using this idea? Well, we could prove that using the idea of comparing logics, which are these two transforms that I mentioned before. So let me say how in general we can compare logics. Uh, in fact, this is a line from computer scientists who study these two transfers, but uh, we in set theory studied that as well and called it galo Atuki transform, which has been proven quite useful for set theorists. And it is Garcia Matos and Vananen who use these two transforms to compare logics. So here it is, the definition of a two transform. You have two logics, which are triples capital L, which has L satisfaction and S and capital L prime, which has L prime satisfaction prime and S prime. And we say that L, so the first triple is less or equal in the two order than the second one. If there is a pair of functions, F and G, what do they do? F goes from the sentences of the first logic to the sentences of the second logic, goes from L to L prime, and G goes from the structures of the second logic to the structures of the first logic. And for simplicity in this talk, we are going to require that this G is on to. This can be relaxed. The most important thing is this adjointness condition. It means that M prime, for any M prime and S prime, M prime is going to satisfy F of some sentence. Phi, if and only if G of M prime satisfies Phi. So this adjointness, somehow uh, translates the truth of L into the truth in L prime. So if you think of the galois tukey connections in set theory for the tukey order of ultra filters, this is the idea. And the same kind of uh, theorems often can be proved, which state basically that if you can reduce L into L prime, then whatever nice properties that you have in L prime, will be inherited by L. So for example, if L Matos, uh, Garcia Matos and Vanan and prove that if L prime is compact, then so is L. So we can now use this to compare the ultra filter logic and the modeling logic. And we can uh, actually show that the modeling logic is too reduced, is less than the ultra filter logic. 
Uh, so, in fact, there is a background reason that I am studying this. I think it's quite nice to have these nice, simple definitions that somehow embody important concepts, but there is more that I would like to uh, achieve with the study, which is to get better transfer theorems. So we like ultra filters because of Walsh's theorem. And Walsh's theorem allows us to transfer all first order sentences from, from, from the sequence to the ultra product. Uh, what is Walsh's theorem in other contexts? It's kind of hard to tell. What is Walsh's theorem in this modeling concept, for example, or in other combinatorial limits that have been defined? So uh, one would very much like to have clean statements that embody a large number of theorems that people have been able to prove about transfers of sentences by modeling. In fact, uh, in Neshatil or Sona de Mendes' uh, work, there is a number of interesting theorems that show that certain properties like uh, bounded tree depth are preserved by modeling. And I think that it would be very nice to have a logical way in logic to say that. And another thing that I'm very interested in is kind of connected with this from a different perspective is the monadic second order logic, which is a kind of a, a poor brother of second order logic in which you have only a right to quantify over subsets uh, of, the, of the structure. And this turns out to be very relevant to any context of finite uh, sequence of finite models that people study in computer sciences. So perhaps I will just say to finish this talk that uh, you might have already realized that this has a lot of connections with finite model theory in which people really study finite models, but not really sequences of finite models uh, so much. So I think that there is an asymptotic aspect of this that could be connected with, uh, that, that can be connected with things from finite model theory. But I think that uh, this is material for another talk and I'm going to stop now. Thanks very much, Mirna, for a great talk. Super interesting. Uh, do we have Thank questions you. for Mirna? <laughs> anyone, anyone? Tibor seems to have a question. Rather, if you could give us a reference on the very last slide of your talk, because it seems to be unpublished about this two construction, which is actually like an adjoint, a jointness between two logics, the syntax uh -huh. of one yes, logic yes. and the semantics. So there is of a, yes, there is a paper by Garcia, Matos, and Vananen from 2005, which is published. Uh, uh -huh. uh, I can find the reference, but there is on my website uh, our paper with Van Annen is on my website, uh, which is uh, logicconsults.eu, logicconsults.eu. Well, just Google me and you will find my website. There are all my publications. There is this paper and inside there are two transforms, a lot of them, and there is also a reference to Garcia Matos and Van Annen. Because there was so much material in your talk almost like the three axes of, you know, space X, Y, and Z connected <laughs> at the origin. I'm just asking a question about the Z axis and I leave the X and the Y to others. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for saying this. Anyone else? <laughs> so I have a fundamental question then. <laughs> then let's thank Mirna in whatever way Zoom offers us to, as terrible as it is. Oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed seeing you all and uh, having you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you for the talk. It was great. Thanks. Thank Hope you so to much. see you soon, guys.
I can see there is some discussion. I'm sorry, I haven't been following. Or oh, maybe the, uh, is, uh, this is the, the Zoom claps. Yes, I think this is just... Uh, just saying thank you. <laughs> Zoom claps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, then. Bye. All right, I have some...